Well, I think we'll we'll get started and uh, hopefully uh, some others will join us. But um, first of all, I was going to say good afternoon. It's almost it's almost good evening, but Don't good say. afternoon and welcome to our second individual members meet and greet. Um, and I'm so glad so many of you decided to spend this time with us this afternoon. I don't know where some of you are, but it's beautiful here in Maryland today. Um, and spring is on the way. <laughs> spring is coming. So, but uh, I, anyway, I am glad you chose to share this afternoon. And uh, we're going to look forward to hearing some of our stories about Passover. And um, I will introduce myself. I am Gail Goldfarb. I am the co-chair of the individual of individual membership. And I would like to introduce my friend and co-chair, Jill Tomar, who will be hosting this program with me. Hi, Jill. Hi, Jill. <laughs> I'm Jill Tomar. I am um, co-chair, of course, of, of individual member. I'm also a member of Florida Region, at, where I'm the media past president and still member and active. And I am a member now of Central Great Lakes. Fran already left, but I'm a, mem a new member of Central Great Lakes. And because um, I, I moved to Chicago during this pandemic, it was not a good time to move, but things happen. So, and we're, uh, Gail, we're going to go around and have everybody. In yeah, yeah. I was going to uh, just say introduce a couple of other people, and then okay. um, I'll, I'm going to make it a little more informal now <laughs> since we everybody's been talking, but. Um, and just so you know, I'm 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 from uh, like I said, I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I am part of Seaboard Region. And I see some of my former Seaboard people here, and my Seaboard president is here. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> Hello. So it's good to see. It's good to see everybody. Um, we also, I would like you all to to see. I, I know you all probably know Regina Newman, who's um. Uh, a women's league vice president and she along with Meryl Balaban are um, they both serve as the women's league um, membership chair for for um, women's league and um, on our team is uh, Mimi Pollock hi Mimi hi thank you and, and Mimi's actually working with with Jill and myself on individual membership and of uh, we are happy to have today, um, we're very happy to have Margie Miller, the immediate past international president who is an advisor to our committee. And we are very happy to have her. And Margie, I was gonna ask you if you could kind of monitor questions today, if any questions come up. I will be glad to. Okay, that, that would be great. Um, and we are happy to have Barbara Ezring. And Barbara, I know you're here. There she is. <laughs> Barbara is the International um, Tora Fund Chair. And she's just going to give us a little bit of an update, especially for the um, individual members today. Um, and um, last but not least, of course not least, is um, we're very pleased to welcome Rabbi Abby Shirovsky, who is our guest speaker. And um, Rabbi, we're we're so happy to have you today. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna let Jill introduce you in a few minutes, okay? So I don't want to no. give anything away. <laughs> All right. So if you have any questions, um, if you could just you put them in the chat, or we can you can ask them towards the end. And um, since we are a small group, we're gonna just go around and if you just tell us who you are, where you're living, and what region you're from. Um, and, we'll, and, and we'll do our other sharing after, after the rabbi speaks today. So Margie, you're on. I'm going to go across my screen. I am Margie Miller. I live on Long Island in Baldwin, but I've been um, hijacked since the pandemic to my Florida home. So here I sit, but I'm a member of two regions, obviously the fabulous Florida region and BQLI. And as um, Gail said, I'm the past international president. And Barbara? Who hired mm -hmm. Rabbi Ellen Wallace Field. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I am Barbara Ezring. I'm currently the international chair of Torah Fund. 
And until June 30th, I am living in Norfolk, Virginia, and I am a member of um, Seaboard Region, but I'm also still a member in Charlotte, North Carolina um, of a sisterhood there. So I'm a member in Southern Region as well. I didn't realize you were in Norfolk, Barbara. I, I don't know why I didn't know that, but. We're here until June 30th. They'll have a new rabbi in, um, on July 1st. Is your husband retiring? Is your husband retired? Well, no, my husband retired from um, okay. Temple Israel in Charlotte, and we've been here for two years. As he's the interim here. Okay. You know, Temple Israel used to be Temple Israel used to be in Seaboard years ago when I know. it was in Seaboard USY when I was in USY. So I know it started in Seaboard, moved yeah. briefly to Florida, and then they seceded. <laughs> Are you going back to Charlotte? Um, we are. We probably will go back to Charlotte because we need to sell that house. But he's going to be. A, he started applying for new interim positions for next year. I think we just had a quick question for Barbara oh. Carroll. Yeah. No, I asked her where she was going to be going after June. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. We're kind of just, uh, I don't know what you're freewheeling. <laughs> well, whatever congregation gets you, they're lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, glad to have you with us and, and uh, glad you've been part of Seaboard. <laughs> I'll be at the Seaboard Conference and I'll be at the Southern Conference. Good, good. Me too. I'll only be at, I'll be at Seaboard. So. Okay, Mimi. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Mimi Pollack. Uh, and I'd like to give a shout out to my region president, Lori Snow, who happens to be online today, too. And we thank you that you're here, too. So I am uh, a long, long time member of Mid-Atlantic Region. Uh, I'm a past president of the region. And uh, I also belong to the fabulous Florida region. So I just got it covered all over. And i um, very happy to be with all of you. Great. And Excuse me. <laughs> um, I actually used to be in Seaboard region. We lived up in Maryland for 40 some years um, and it's a great region, but we moved to Florida and I am a part of the Florida region. I am a past region president from 2013 to 2015. Um, and then situations, whatever, I became an individual member. Um, and uh, you know, I, to me, there's nothing like Women's League. I, I am a member of a congregation here. It's sort of renewal. It's not reconstruction or whatever. Nice group of people, wonderful rabbi, um, but there's no conservative that I can join. Um, but I'm just so thrilled that I can still be part of Women's League because it just means an awful lot to me. And which, which, which uh, synagogue in, in Seaboard? Uh, it was Beth Israel in Randallstown, oh, in Randallstown. which is Owings Mills now, but right. yeah, Beth Israel. Yep. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Regina. Hi, I'm Regina Newman, and I, um, as Gail said earlier, I am co-chair of the membership committee with Meryl Balaban, and um, I'm the immediate past president of Southern Region. And we're glad to have Barbara. And no matter where she is, she is always a Southern <laughs> Region member. <laughs> and um, we do have uh, other members. I, I don't want some. I didn't want you to feel bad about belonging to a, a reform or other type of synagogue because we have other individual members who are um, belong to reform, and even someone who. I, uh, that I can think of offhand that used to be on the international board for several years. And she now belongs to a uh, reform synagogue and is an individual member with us. So, um, you know, and anytime y'all want to come down, if you know, um, Audrey, and I think several of you know who Audrey is. Audrey is also Southern region. So y'all come back here. Yeah? <laughs> Very good. Okay, Carol Wallens. Um, I'm an individual member with BQLI, but I also joined Congregation Beth uh, Toradell in 
Ocean Township. And so their sisterhood is also part of Women's League. But I think this Zoom is fantastic and the programs are wonderful and it really keeps you connected with the world. <laughs> so. That is true. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're here. And when, you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled about that. I might be signing off early because I expect Ellen and her family, they're coming over for her birthday. So I nice. don't know when they're coming. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we're, we'll keep moving then. So we'll get, okay. we'll get. <laughs> Susie, can you just, just again, tell us where you're from and, and I know you did already, but. Okay, sure. I, I live now in Mount Vernon, New York. When I was in Brooklyn, we belonged to a German Orthodox congregation, really strictly Orthodox, where when the Torah was marched around the synagogue, first of all, that march took 10 seconds, but we were told as kids, we were told, don't look, don't look. And when the Torah came past, all the women, well, everybody, but all the women bowed low. So the I, looked, I looked and it's one of the memories that I have of that congregation. It was like a wave. <laughs> if you can imagine each row upon row, exactly as the rabbi raced through, bowing low. And it was, um, that's, that's my Orthodox memory. We moved to a house in Queens and I was a US wire at uh, Forest Hills Jewish Center. Then I went to college and became let's just say an agnostic. And I announced that to my mother and her remark was, but you'll go to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with your father, right? Yeah. And of course I said, yes. <laughs> so, um, and my, I married a man who grew up classic reform and we uh, tried a conservative synagogue in Mount Vernon when we moved there and we were told not to come back. We were not from enough. So we joined a reform synagogue where we have been members since the 70s. Wow. And really, as, as I mentioned, um, a sense of community that I've never had in a, from a synagogue before. Thank you for giving me a second chance. Wonderful. Yeah, that's so nice. Lori. I'm Lori Snow. I'm president of the Mid-Atlantic region. I live in Audubon. That's right, Amy, you tell them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I live in uh, Audubon, Pennsylvania, which is not near anything but near anything but the King of Prussia Mall. So we meet there to go shopping and go out for lunch, which I miss quite a bit, I have to admit. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Glad you're here. Meryl, hi. You're on mute. Right, yeah. I was thrown off because I'm on the top row on mine. So it's just, uh, you yeah. know, where I was on yours. You're on the third so, row. <laughs> so I'm Meryl Balaban. And as you know, I'm the co-chair of the membership uh, of Women's League Membership Committee. I'm from uh, the Garden State region. I live in New Jersey most of the time, but for a few months and right now I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida. So um, enjoying, enjoying the weather and uh, welcome. I'm glad you all came to this meeting. Okay, Jerry. So I'm Jerry Genezer and I live in Southington, Connecticut and I'm part of the North Atlantic region. Um, I'm a former Connecticut Valley branch president, uh, but we merged with the New England region a number of years ago. So uh, we're all one region now. And uh, I do belong to a conservative synagogue that's affiliated with United Synagogue, but the sisterhood is not affiliated anymore. Hmm. The year that I joined, they had dropped out the year before. And uh, Eve Gold and I did our best to try to <laughs> bring them back, but they really, um, we couldn't convince them. Anyway, so I joined as an individual member and have enjoyed being an individual member all along. I still get all the region mail and I still get all the national mail and uh, participate when I can. So, um, and this year I'm actually going to be doing something for our conference. So um, our, our region president, Esta, asked me to do something and I said I would. So um, I stayed along, you know, stayed invo uh, involved as best I can. 
That's great. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Hi, Kathy. Hi there, Kathy Latofsky, Seaboard Region President. Uh, I am a transplant three ways. I went, came from upstate New York to Florida through high school, then Maryland for college and never left. So I have been in Maryland ever since, but I still call Binghamton home. <laughs> um, I, I'm very uh, fortunate uh, to have uh, this group um, and uh, all of you as uh, VPs and your positions and all of my region presidents who are on, we have been a very strong group and hopefully we can learn a little bit about what else we can do for our individual members that we might not already be doing so uh, as region presidents. So uh, hopefully uh, they all get my weekly message and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, Gina. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for coming. Uh, sure, sure. I was uh, just registering and thank God the uh, connection came to me. So That's I was great. able to join. I am Pacific Southwest Region President. And uh, basically what I do for the individual in my region, I send all our emails to them. Uh, the, uh, board uh, announcements and also the Shabbat greetings. So I think we are doing as much as we can do, but I am open to any suggestion to see what you want us to do and it is welcome. Well, thank thank you. you for this group. Good, good. Well, if you have any questions as we go along, you'll let us know. Okay, you just write them in the chat. That would be great. Wendy? Hello. You're Wendy, muted, you're, Wendy. You're muted. I know I'm muted, but my <laughs> controls disappeared because I had two screens and it was in between it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Wendy Glasser and I am president of the North by Northwest region. I guess I'm also a three-way transplant. I started out when I was about 27 in the New England region, and then I moved to Seaboard. Uh, most of my Seaboard time was in Fairfax, Virginia at Olam Tikva, where, and back then, Seaboard did a lot of leadership training. And uh, I think the reason I'm president of Beth David and North by Northwest now is because the, of all the leadership training I got through Women's League. So I am extremely grateful. And I always tell people how wonderful Women's League is. The other great thing that I did through Women's League way back when, when I moved here in 1997, I knew at the preceding Women's League International Conference that I was moving to California. And I went to what was then the Northern California branch meetings and introduced myself. And when I moved here, I knew people. So um, for our individual members, if you are able to go to a conference, come and meet us and you'll have friends all over the country and all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. I think I got everybody. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jill now and I'm gonna let you introduce the rabbi and then we'll hear where she's from. <laughs> we'll let her do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. She is my niece. Her mother is also a member of Mid-Atlantic Region. She, um, active, an active member in Mid-Atlantic Region, actually. Um, Rabbi Abby Shirovsky. She, Abby, Abby, Rabbi Shirovsky is the JCRC, dire, JCRC's Director of Intergroup Relations, JCRC Rabbi in Residence. She studied the Jewish Theological Seminary and was ordained in 2012. Abby also holds a master's degree from the Davidson School of Education at the, at the Jewish Theological Seminary from the Davidson School of Jewish Education. Oh, I just said that. Okay. Specializing in experimental Jewish education. Abby was Jewish Chaplain's Council, where she worked 
with Jewish military personnel and veterans. Rabbi Shrofsky is the recipient of the 2016 JPRO Network Young Professional Award for her dedication to the Jewish community through her work in Jewish not-for-profit field. She is, she is a Rabbis Without Borders Fellow 2018 cohort. She currently serves on the Executive Council of the Rabbinical Assembly. Abby lives in Silver Springs, Maryland with her husband, David Wiesel, and her two children, Judah and Eleanor, which I love. So, <laughs> Abby, I convinced my mom to join us too. So. Oh, so, oh, good. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah. I, was thinking of that, Barbara. I told you. So. Oh, I didn't, okay. <laughs> no, no, I told my mom. I said, Are you sure? Oh. I said, Jill told me to. So. <laughs> I didn't want to call you Barbara, but I never did. So, okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Aunt Jill. Um, hi, I'm Rabbi Abby Shrofsky. Rabbi Abby, Rabbi Abby is fine. Um, and yes, and my, my mom just joined us, Barbara Shrofsky. She is the you're the Tower Fund chair for for the for the region or for for Bethel. Barbara, you can my sisterhood, my sisterhood Bethel in Voorhees, New Jersey. So. Um, so she, she, they all figure in, she figures into my intro in general. So you'll learn a little bit about her. You'll learn a little bit about everyone. Um, although my mom definitely can speak for herself. She's pretty cool like that. So, um, like my bio said, I am the rabbi in residence and the director of intergroup relations for the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. I live in Silver Spring. My family, um, we are a part of Or Kodesh congregation uh, in Chevy Chase, and I am not in Women's League. Uh, not for any reason in particular, but I feel like the, it's sort of like this osmosis thing that's happened. The only thing I need to do is like send in my check. Um, I've, <laughs> I've taught for a few women's league programs. Um, Rabbi Ellen is an amazing colleague and friend and mentor. And I actually have her to thank for getting connected to my current job and um, getting into um, leadership roles within the rabbinical assembly. So um, it's wonderful to hear, it's wonderful when people say great things about your friends. So um, it, it was, Carol, I know you are felling, but there's also like this friendship fell that was going on too. Um, so women's, and I, I start off by telling a little bit about how I come to all of this because it leads into my talk about um, how we get to the, how we get to Pesach, how we get to Passover. And the, the title of my, my talk, The Stories We Tell. So Passover is about stories. And it's about this, it's, it's about the idea of retelling. So I want you to think of one thing and we're gonna do this thing. I, so I was at with the, we did it virtually, of course, the rabbinical assembly convention last week. And we did this thing called a chatterfall and it was very cool. Um, everyone thought of, like you thought of what you wanted to say, you put one or two words in the chat, but you didn't hit send right away. You just put it so that way it's not, um, you don't see everyone else and no one else is influencing it. And then we all hit send at the same time and you see all of the thoughts come out. So what is your favorite, just think about it, write it down and don't hit send till I say, what is your favorite part of Passover? Okay, give another 10 seconds and then hit send. Being together, sitting at the table, family, little kids doing the four questions, family, doing a ritual like all the Jews around the world, hearing my grandchildren sing, oh, thanks mom. Diane being with family, family togetherness, family, the aromas, hot, nice, family. Oh. Um, I think even the, I think this year the, the family piece is probably bubbling to the top a little more since last year was kind of a bit of a mess when it came to that part. Um, but the, 
that that piece of being with the family, family togetherness, because what happens when we're when we're all together with the family? What do we start to do? And and you, you can unmute. It's okay. And and talk. What do we start to do when we're all with our families? Tell stories. We tell stories. Talk over each other. Yeah, <laughs> we're very good at that. You update correct them. others. Update people in their storytelling. <laughs> the storytelling, yeah. Right. We correct people. We update people. We we update the narrative, um, and we are we're constantly adding to it. So um, when I was thinking about this program today and what we you know, what you were talking about, this idea of bringing in your a ritual object, something to share about Passover, I thought about you know what what is it that I would bring, and I I mean. So last year was the first time that I ever made a Seder from like on my own. I know I, I've been a rabbi for a number of years, but I've always either gone to my mom's house or I went to, for a while. We were going to um, my brother-in-law's house in Great Neck um, or we were going to my grandma's house. Like I, I never had to do this. And this was like a huge undertaking. So Kola Kavod to all of you who put it on because- so, I'm glad that we're going back to, to Bubby's house this year. Um, everyone's very glad we're going back to Bubby's this year. Um, but the one thing that I realized, so I didn't have a Seder plate because I claimed the Seder plate that the Lennox one that's at my mom's house that I already said I'm getting that one. So I didn't have a Seder plate. I didn't have a matzah cover. I didn't have glasses. I didn't have, I had nothing, but I had... Let's see if my back holds up with it. I had a whole stack of Haggadot, okay? All different Haggadot. Oh, yeah. Another one. I like to use this one a lot. Um, and so, and this isn't even all of them. This, there are a couple more floating around, not to mention a bunch of art scroll, plus a bunch of copies of PJ Library. Somehow we were sent not just like two PJ Libraries, but we got a whole set of six, which is great because there are four people in my family, which means that we could, of course, have guests during the pandemic, which, right. So why is it so I, I had nothing else but we were covered in the Haggadah range so I, I said I said to my husband well okay at least we have something um and I as all of the you know the aromas and the smells are coming from the kitchen and I'm trying to kosher things and cook things I'm also trying to sew together a matzah cover out of um out of what did I do out of two pillowcases because this is what I needed to do Erev Pesach I needed to be sewing together a matzah cover because I didn't have one and I, I think about all of these things and I tell this story because this is part of the preparation when we think about what is it that goes into the preparation and what is it that goes into it it's this story that we will share um, we'll tell our families when they get together. I went shopping four times already and I couldn't find it to go to three different stores. I had to kosher this. I had to do that. I, did you, were you able to find olive oil this year? Were you able to find, and in a lot of ways, that's, uh, that's as much Pesach. That's as much the Seder and the telling as sitting around with the rabbis and B'nai Brak. So let's talk a little bit about them. Let's get into the Haggadah a bit. Um, which one will I pick up? Here. We're gonna go with, um, we're gonna go with this one. We're gonna go with the Lovell Haggadah, um, which was designed by uh, Math Rabbi Matthew Berkowitz. Um, and the artwork in it is amazing. It really, it's, if you buy the actual Lovell Haggadah, it's like this hand gold inlay, um, excuse me, it, it's it's just, it's all art, it's like thousands and thousands of dollars. I got the book for like 20. So this is fine. This goes at the Seder table with me. It's beautiful. Um, and I I get into it and I start reading from it. And I look, I like the pictures. I like the art. I like to see what's going to keep me going and keep me, um, keep me occupied during the Seder because I get bored, which is fun. Um, but I think about why is it that we're doing this again every year? And we get to the parts and, and I feel like we, everyone at their Seder 
gets to this part of okay we start off we do we do the things that are um that are interesting they're tangible right away we have um we we sing kadesh or hats we um we have a little bit of wine we have the vegetable we dip um we we ask the four questions of Adim Hayinu, and then it gets into Magid, this really, just this, the rabbis were gathering, and what, and they're talking, and they're, and they get in, you have to tell the story, but maybe you shouldn't tell the story at this time, what should we do, and the, the piece that I get into really with it is, why are we talking about other people talking? Why are we doing that? What is the point of hearing, of reading about someone else saying, you have to tell the story, you have to do this, when is that even the story? Is talking about the story the same as telling the story? So what do people think about that? But your, your, first, your first reaction to hearing the Haggadah as a, um, it's, it's a story about the story. So I think many of us are, are, as adults, have heard the story so many times, we want a different story. <laughs> so in order to have a different story, we need to also come up with that. I know I've done a women's Seder, I've done other, you know, things to um, change, um, not the whole story, but enough of the story that it makes it interesting for us to be at the table with the family doing what we need to do and keeping everybody interested. That's I mean, Yeah. Yeah, that'd be. And I was just saying, they're also like, I have new a number of Haggadot and I think just reading different translations and different inserts that they put in them also helps keep you not, not from being bored. Also, uh, you know, reading other readings um, and adding it to the Seder each year also can help just bringing new ideas and stuff. Um, I personally, um, I like the the way the Haggadah um, puts the story together for us through personal conversations or, or, or ideas that they, because somehow it, it just gets to be a little bit more interesting rather than just reading it like a history book. A history book you can get very bored with, but you know, if you kind of hear a semi-dialogue going on there, um, I, I think it gets to be a little bit more something that you would want to be understanding and listening to. That's a really great point, Mimi. And I think that's what makes the Haggadah sort of a, a bestseller among, you know, when we talk about Jewish literature and Jewish text, um, how many of you have uh, a volume of Talmud in your house? Okay, it's not a bad amount. I have a couple. Um, and you have a Haggadah. So you have a small amount of Talmud in your, everyone here, if you have a Haggadah, you have a small amount of Talmud. The, there are sections of the, the, the Haggadah um, or Agadah is a, you know, is from, is, sorry, um, is from um, the Talmud. It is a, it was discussions in um, the Tractate Pesachim, Mesechet Pesachim. And it, when we get into the, and this rabbi said, and you would think that they would mean this, these are all these, ta these, um, these Talmudic devices and uh, part of the discussion that the rabbis were having at that time. And the way that it was lifted up and this idea of, well, we need to have the story, uh, the story surrounding the story, and it needs to be a conversation rather than a history text. So Mimi, your point about um, having it as a conversation makes it more interesting, I think is key. Because when we talk about getting together and we talk about this, this central observance of, um, you know, uh, of the Jewish year, we, we don't do it because it's a, um, you know, be, because we love to sit and read from a history text. We make sure that we have these interesting Haggadot. We make sure that we have uh, these gatherings because it adds to the riches of the conversation. And by having this, by going through the Haggadah, we not only are learning the text, but we're learning the context. 
and we're learning that the point wasn't, the point was not so that we know exactly which child said what, but that there, that, but that there are aspects of how we ask and how we teach. There are aspects of how we explain to different types of people, to different personalities, many of which are probably sitting around your family's table. I know they're sitting around mine. Um, right, mom? And, um, <laughs> you know, we can, we can definitely see ourselves and we can see our family members in that story. And when we talk about you should teach your children, that is because of what you know, the Holy One did for me that we were like, these are the central pieces. We're still trying to teach our children. This is because of how I believe of how I practice of what I experience. I kosher the pot this way, because this is what, how my mother kosher the pot. I, so, um, last year when we didn't, when, you know, when everything started in height of pandemic, um, it was the first, I think it was one of the first times during Pesach when I did not have my mom's commish bread. Um, I actually, I, I called her and I'm like, it's not the same. My mom baked a whole batch, put them in a Tupperware and shipped them from Cherry Hill to Silver Aww. Spring, like overnighted them. I remember we got them, we opened it up. We all, the kids and I, we, we opened it up and it's like, about these house the kids were because that's that's Passover that's the same kind of thing as as having the um you know we read the story every year we hear these different um we hear the same stories we have the same foods we do the same things for the same reason that we want that the rabbis were gathering in B'nai Brak to tell the stories of the exodus from Egypt and we keep doing this because that's the legacy. That's the whole idea of how it carries on. So the stories that we tell and the objects that are associated with those stories are what makes Pesach, Pesach. Um, I wanna just share something a colleague wrote. Um, small desk, lots of books. In the observant life. Um, for many of you, many of you probably had um, uh, Isaac Klein uh, guide to religious living and like that volume awesome awesome volume I believe it's currently out of print the um, the rabbinical assembly a number of years ago came out with just under a decade ago came out with the observant life which gives a very um, a much more narrative and broader perspective on a lot of these different legal um, and sort of like the halakha around things like the the legal aspects of Judaism, but also um, with a, a very with definitely more of a 21st century mindset. Um, and um, I wanted just to read something that my colleague Alan Lucas um, wrote in so he different rabbis edited different sections he edited the sections on the section on holy days and holidays and he wrote about the Haggadah one of the most crucial factors in determining the quality of a Seder has to do with the choice of the right edition of the Haggadah there are many from which to choose in fact the Haggadah has been published in more editions than any other Jewish book since the dawn of printing, more than 3,000 of them. Um, keeps going, keeps going. So, and it, it, he talks about the Haggadah can be seen as a fixed script to be read out loud or as a jumping off point for lively discussion and debate. A Seder discussion that veers off from we were slaves in Egypt to a debate regarding the various things that still enslave people today is not a bad thing. It is the main thing. So I know that we often put pressure on ourselves. Did we get through the Haggadah? Did we get through the Seder? Have we done everything? And I, I, I read what my colleague has written. And I, I think to myself, if we have gathered, if we've had the Matzah, we've had the Mara, we've had the Pesach, we've had those key things, and we've taken the time to teach and to learn from each other and share these stories, um, then yes, 
we have completed the Seder. We have been able to, to engage in, in the primary commandment of it, that we are telling those around us, we are telling our, our descendants, we're telling the, the people that we have gathered that this is important. This is something that we are doing because of what it reminds us of. And this is something that we want you to keep doing because it keeps the story going. Questions. Yes, you're correct. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, Abby. Thank you. Not a, not a question, nice. but sure, just sure. on it, though. You know, um, I grew up Orthodox, and it was all in Hebrew, and nobody knew what anything was being said. That was it. When I started doing the Seders, and I started, we would read. I had the Maxwell House, but then I went and I bought this yeah. one. I don't know if you can see the passive mm -hmm. freedom. Yeah. I love it. It's got so much midrash in it, and it's got so much. But my my grandchildren were young, so I started trying to do things so that they would still stay at the table and whatever. And I did plagues for a long time, visual and feeling good and plagues and they loved it and they would take them home and whatever. Well, they're all teenagers now. And I- That's its own play. I'm not yeah. gonna throw hail <laughs> and I'm, I'm not gonna pour the red into the white and it's, I'm, I'm just not, cause I think they're too old at this point, but I was going online to see what I could find to do plagues or to do something else that's more for teenagers. Because I want them to be interested I ask them questions, they answer, they do, but I, I think it has to be relevant to those that you want to take forward with it. Um, my children know, but they're all grown. They're the parents. Um, so I, I, that's what I'm researching now is how to make this relevant to these teenagers. They're ranging from 13 to, he's, how old is he? Seven, 18, he's 18. And his brother is, hopefully will be on Zoom from New York. If not, he'll be at a Seder, but um, so that's that's what I want to do is I want to make it relevant. I want them to get more something out of it for who they are now. They did as children that way. So and and what I think is so fascinating about that, first of all, that that you're going to have that many teenagers, God willing, at your table, um, my, you apart. know, yes, <laughs> strength so much strength to you um and that they that they will all sit there and and participate that is yashar koach and and i think that it may th that they may enjoy i mean i i don't know them at all obviously they may enjoy the things that that were done from when they were little secretly they may still enjoy it <laughs> and there may be and they won't tell you they're not going to tell you god forbid they should well they might tell you as the grandparent they would never tell their parents um but they they wouldn't give them that satisfaction but <laughs> they may still enjoy it and what could be interesting is just asking them what is rel what is a plague for you right now well, what is going yeah. on you know what what are the plagues that you see in this world right now? Now, it could open up in all kinds of a discussion and it's being prepared to, to know that, that there's so much has happened in a year that you know a, we've seen a lot of these plagues. Um, we, we've seen injustice. We've seen you know, death and, and destruction. It's, it's been bad. And um, you know, Plagues might be something we tread a little lightly on this year. And it's something to think about that, you know, what the what the rabbis were doing in putting together this Seder and making it accessible and making text and discussion open was a revolutionary thing. That it was something that was happening in the home. It wasn't temple-based. It wasn't um, so this was completely open and accessible to everyone, and everyone had to do it. So that's another, like, it's okay for it to be out of the ordinary and it's okay for it to be awkward and uncomfortable because the first couple satyrs probably were, they were not, you know, they weren't set like this. They were making it up as they went along. So it's okay to, to take some risks and to see what, um, it'd be interesting to see what your teenagers bring to, yes. you know, bring to the conversation. 
Yeah, Regina. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, to suggest something also that um, um, I have uh, been going to some of the classes offered at Emory University that are on Zoom, obviously. Um, and one of them was on uh, telling stories. And it was said there that when grandparents tell stories about the parents to the grandchildren, there it get, builds a resilience in the kids and that the intergenerational self gives the kids um, a sense of um, possession, I guess, and what we're supposed to be like. So, you know, even though you, you and like my upbringing, young upbringing was uh, orthodox and I didn't understand what was going on, except, you know, you should drink your wine now that, you know, um, those sort of things, but you can um, tell them what your children were like, <clears throat> how your children reacted to things and let them know what was going on and they will see the progression and, and own it. great idea that it really yeah Mimi um in order to um, have everyone at the Seder tables and we've been doing this for a lot of years uh participate together uh about 15 possibly 20 years ago I don't know I finally sprung for an entire set of Haggadot of the same exactly the same Haggadah so that we could sit at the table yeah, I bought 24 of them. I figured if I ever have more than 24, I'll kill myself. But 24 <laughs> people would have been fine. So um, anyway, so and what we do, and we've done this for, for years, is we go around the table. And even the youngest, they might struggle through a paragraph, but everybody gets a paragraph. And then it goes on to the next. So at least everybody's hearing the story. And nobody can balk because the kid before them did it. And, you know, so it just goes around the table. So now I've got these wonderful hot bed dough, which I, I adored and I love, that are now filled with um, a little bit of wine and a, a, some matzo crumbs from previous years. And it just makes them vintage and we love them and we still use them. The stains are the best part. Yeah. yeah. And the crumbs. In the jam, <laughs> like most of us have bought the Haggadahs from like Katav, the um, yellow and black ones, you know, and they were a dollar, dollar fifty each. And because they were so inexpensive, if you didn't have a million Maxwell houses, so that you can have, 50, you know, 30 Haggadahs in the house, um, Haggadah. And there are so many more now, but you can't buy $15 Haggadahs for everybody. You just, unless you sat and made a, you know, a, a family fundraiser out of it. So it's frustrating because there's better material, there's more kid-friendly, adult-friendly, teen-friendly, creative, just conversation-friendly, but you just always feel like I'll make a copy of that one page and as the leader, I'll do that page, but you're kind of stuck um, with the box of the ones you've been using forever, even if you don't feel that those are the most, um, you know, the best way to reach the audience, shall we say. Which is why my, fa my, my parents years ago invested in the Art Scroll family Haggadah. I don't even think it was, I don't know if it was up to my mom and dad more than it was my Zeta, um, that we have the Art Scroll family Haggadah, which as I became more and more into um, who I am as, as a Jew and as a woman and, and all of that um, and started switching out gendered God language and I'm reading through it and I'm like, and God, they're like, how come she's not saying, Hey, it's like, Shh, Martin, she does this every year. It's fine. Just keep going. <laughs> and it's like, that's not on the page. Why is it? Why did she change it again? It's like, it's okay. Just keep going. <laughs> um, Right. And because sometimes you have to make those adaptions and we switch things around and, and, and that's okay. That's all perfectly kosher. Well, I will tell you that um, my two girls wanted to know why I kept certain things from their preschool and their Jewish education and whatnot. The only thing I have left that I do have are the Haggadot that they made. Because I think now with my granddaughters, which I have two, I can share that with them and they can go through the Seder at the same time with 
the Haggadah that their mother made. And it is age appropriate for them. So we'll be telling that story because this is what they used and now they can use it uh, this year. My granddaughters are five and two. So uh, I, and I have, you know, both of them in pristine condition. <laughs> so, wow. you know, it is important that we do that, but we can do it by telling the story. And I will say my youngest daughter has a great tradition. She has a tablecloth. She has everyone who is a guest. She always has a guest every year. They sign their name on the tablecloth and she embroiders it. And then the following year, you add a name every single year and um, her guests to our to the Seder um, become part of the story that we tell every year, which is lovely. Yeah. That's love so that. cool. Yeah, I yeah. love that. That yeah. takes a level of commitment that I I just I don't have, but wow, I wish I did. That's <laughs> but so you could so do it cool. a simply way. I had once that we made really lovely Passover um, place cards because we'd want people to sit. The ones that are really going to help me in the kitchen will cl sit closer. The yeah. landlocked ones are never going to help on a good day, so they're against the back. But every year, depending on who's coming, so many many people through the years have come, and we have them all. And, and, and one year I had about 25 people to a Seder and I didn't have the place cards. I think I was moving. It was the first time in that house. And I've done this. If you ever want to know what to do with your old peepote that you save in bags from everybody's whatever, <laughs> everybody had to sit at the yarmulke from their bar mitzvah, wedding and or whatever. P and I had 50 years worth. People were hysterical that they couldn't believe I had them, let alone that that was their place card. And um, so that was a nice little way to, but I think I like the idea, Anne, of still having the cotton balls to throw. I don't care how old they are, because I think there's something lovely about the kids just saying, they know Passover is going to have cotton balls on the table and little lambs and, and cows and whatever. Um, and decorations, Kathy, my kid is, my kids are 40 and 42. I still have Hanukkah project, uh, Passover projects they made. And when I set up that room, they're hanging from the window, the plagues from one kid, he's 40. He made it when he was like seven. And they cannot believe that it's just like a holy space. And it's it's just, um, I hope they get a kick out of it. I do, if nothing else. I'm sure that, so I'm sure they do get a kick out of it because they, I think that, so the go, very quickly going back to what Anne, what you were saying, I think that your grandchildren, if you didn't do the things that they did when they were little, they'd say, how come we didn't do that? So I think adding in the conversation of how their lives are now, but don't forget to do this cotton balls or the or the spilling, whatever you did the, with the plagues, I think that they would miss it if you didn't do it. Um, in our house, I have several sets of Haggadot based on how old my children were. So I have a set when, when my kids were little, we had more little kids than we had grownups. So we had, I bought a set, a whole set of Haggadot, probably 24 of the, um, um, I forget who published it, but it had a lot of kid things in it. So the frog song was it in was it. It was the Carbon Family Haggadah. Carbon thing. Family Haggadah. Yeah. So then all of a sudden the kids were getting too old for that. So that's when we get the art scroll ones. I found those to be very two man centric. So I don't use those anymore. We use them for a little bit and then there was something else. And then a couple of years ago, we had, uh, since we really didn't love the art scroll ones anymore to use on for, you know, the kids were not interested in, oh, our family had incorporated a lot of non-Jewish family and they felt it was a little intimidating. They were giving out the Maxwell House ones again in, the, in ShopRite. So we went and said, how many can we take? He said, how many do you want? I went 24 up here. And we, they hand us 24. So we're back to Maxwell House, which is what my mother used. So it, it just came full circle and using the Maxwell's to me, it was like being in my mom's house for Seder. And that hasn't happened in many, many years. So it, it just, to me, it's warmth. And I think my kids are like, why are we using that? It's good. You'll like it. Don't worry about but it. But it's the updated Maxwell house. It's the updated it's like Maxwell house. Maxwell house and, with like the. Yeah. The and, the, and I also got last year, the, or the two years ago, the Maxwell house one from the Mrs. Maisel. Oh yeah. I so, have that one sitting here too. Yeah. It was really cute. They had like her Very wine cute. spills on it. Yeah, it was cute. 
So fun things like that. We just try to make it fun. So, all right. So when you say about, I, I also have a, a challah cover and a matzah and avikomen bags and things like that. And every year I kind of rotate the different child that it was. Um, I don't have from my grandchildren. That's funny because they must give it to their mother. Or whatever. Although I don't think they do that as much in some of the religious schools, to be them. honest. Um, but I, I do. I do keep that. It's funny you say do this again. I Maybe I will. I Maybe not extensively, but um, I know they always loved it. And, and their parents think I'm silly, but that's okay because I did not do this with my own children. That, that's the thing. My own children did not get, as to me, the best of satyrs, but my grandchildren have. So um, I thank you all because that's, Cause that's you know, what bubbies do. Yeah. We I'm call that in our house, we I'm call that them. she's gone full bubby. Yes, yes. But, um, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, I, I think we just have to make it interesting for them and yet they still have to learn. And that's what they do. Because even when I question them, they know. So it helps. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Susie, I think you wanted to say something. Yes. Um, when um, we started, when the kids were really young, the grandkids were really young, um, they sometimes interrupted and said, we learned that song, <laughs> but not with that, not, li not like that song is the way they, they put it. So um, if my husband was leading the Seder, he, in advance, we contacted whichever families were, were to, you know, sending their kids, especially to, to a, a Jewish nursery or, or preschool program or something and said, get ready to sing something and teach us the song. So that kept them interested at least all through the first half, which was basically what they were, the only thing that they could stay up for anyway. So that was a lot of fun. I learned all the hand movements and stuff like that. So thank you so much for, um, for welcoming me. I have to get to another program that I'm doing. So um, part of my, my work, I, like I said, I'm with the JCRC of Greater Washington and we do a lot of uh, interfaith dialogue stuff. So I'm going to leave this call and go to a call with teens from, um, uh, Jewish teens from all over the DMV. Uh, not all, I mean, it's like 10 of them. Um, and uh, a group from Potomac Presbyterian. So we're going to dialogue with the Presbyterians, but it has been wonderful to meet everyone and to spend the afternoon. Thank you, Aunt Jill, for inviting me. Um, and it was just, this has been great. So Chag Sameh. We'll, we'll have to have you again, Rabbi. That was wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Hmm? Thank you, Abby. Uncle Scott said, go ahead. You might say hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hi, Scott. Hi, <laughs> Joe. <Okay. laughs> Bye, everyone. I'm going to go walk the dog. Thanks Bye, again. Abby. Thanks, Abby. Um, Good to see everybody. Thank before, you. Before we kind of, well, yeah, see if anybody has other things to share, but bef before we do that, I just, Barbara, I'm so sorry. I meant to do you before, and I don't want to forget you, it, because for the, um, especially about the Torah fund pins, if, if you have any updates for the individual members that we have. Okay. Let me update you real quickly about uh, whatever's going on in uh, Torah fund. So um, I have a list that I have been collecting of um, women who are individual members of um, Women's League who have made donations at uh, levels of 100, donation levels of $180 plus. So you are entitled to a pin. And um, I know that Anne has a pin because I see you're wearing it. Um, if, you have get, have, if you've made a donation of over $180, um, some of the regions are sending the Pins, some of the region Torah fund, Torah fund vice presidents have purchased the, have, have the pins for the people from their regions and some don't. So 
I have a list. I'm going to check out who has received a pin and who hasn't. But if you've made the donation and you haven't received a pin yet, then please, please um, me an email and let me put my email address in the chat right now. Um, and if anybody has any questions or have a problem getting a hold of Barbara, feel free to contact either me or Gail also. Okay. Um, and I, I want you to know also that last week, the Torah Fund Cabinet, uh, we told the Torah Fund Cabinet that we're still distributing pins. We, we ran out of pins uh, at certain levels and we have to order more. This is a good thing because it means more people donated than we expected, um, but it also means that we have to order more pins and it takes a while for them to come. So we're going to be distributing these pins for a while, but hopefully as long as the order comes in on time, everyone will have their pin by Rosh Hashanah of this year, 20, <laughs> we're in 2021. 21, yes. Okay, well, I'll have a pin to wear. I don't have one either. I, um, I'm still wearing that pin um, because we, we ran out of certain levels. I sent my pin to somebody who made a donation so she would have her pin. So I'm just waiting now, just like everyone else for the, the new order to come. Um, and if you know of somebody who, um, who, has, uh, who has made that donation, then uh, please just let me know. You've got my email address and there's a question Oh, yes, you may make payments. You do not have to pay it all at once. Um, if you go online, you'll see that uh, on the online donation page. And um, let me put that in here too. It's a new. If you go to that page, inspired.jtsa.edu slash Torah Fund, um, you'll see that you can make, uh, you don't have to pay everything all at once. You can, um, you can pay it off and make payments. Thank you, Anne. Um, so we're gonna be wearing this pin for a while. You have, you have time, but if you, um, if you did make a donation and you did not receive a pin, please let me know tonight or tomorrow because we, we do need to make that, uh, we need to uh, make that order so that the pins eventually come in. And um, if another way that you can um, donate to Torah Fund is through the new e-cards platform that we have. Um, we have, I think right now, there are five different cards on the site and um, the cards can be sent for any occasion or to send a little note to someone. It's $5 per recipient and all of that money supports the students in our, at our seminaries. So I will put that in here too. Torah Fund eCards, .jtsa.edu. If I type it right. Um, do you have any questions about Torah Fund? Meryl. Yeah, just to clarify. So the pin, which I still haven't gotten yet. Um, so it's a 2021 pin will be the pin for 2122. Is that what you were saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll have a new theme and a new pin for um, the 2022-2023 year. Right. This allows us to... Um, use that money that would have been spent on the new pin and use that money for our um, students. So just to clarify um, my understanding, so the, the, I, I saw the JTSA mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure that the money was coming through WL, the, the Women's League. So the, that's the Jewish Theological Seminary. That's correct. It goes to all the seminaries. Right. When you make a donation to the Biafra General Campaign, the Jewish Theological Seminary administers Torah Fund. Okay. 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 They do the work for us. This is this is a um, women's league. It's women's leagues 
dedicated philanthropy, but they do the work for us. They, they administer the fund for us. So that's why it all says jtsa.edu on all those e email addresses. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, when, when you make the donation to the Biachai campaign, it goes to all five seminaries. In New York, okay. Los Angeles. Okay. If anybody has any more questions for Barbara, you can put it in the chat. Um, or I, send her an email. We, yeah, or send her an email. Um, let's let's go. Let's get along with the rest of the program. I we brought we told everybody to bring a um, a Kedor mitzvah or a Jewish something it meant to us some an item ritual item that meant something to you for Pesach. So, um, I mean, I can get, why don't I start first? How about that? I have a lot of stuff, a lot of Judaic. And I also, I was chair of my Judaic account shop for years. So I, um, I was one of my best customers, <laughs> but what I, and I have lots of stuff, but what I brought was, unfortunately, I have, this is my original, this is the first data plate I ever got. And I got it as an engagement gift 40 years ago. Um, it was a tradition in the family my, from my mother and my mother's best friend who they, she knows since she was kindergarten, basically treated it, that we all got the Lenox Seder plate, and I, and I think I was the oldest one to get married, um, a Lenox Seder plate and a letter and a Lenox Koseliahu for an engagement gift. Every one of us got it. This is probably the, I, I mean, I, it didn't sit, it sit in the box for about 20 years, probably because I never had my own Seder till then anyway. And then um, my own son, my son, who's the oldest of the grandchild, grandchildren on my side, when he got engaged, my father gave, actually my father gave him his, that was my mother's, instead of buying him a new one. And so he has it. My niece who got married next decided she wanted something more, something more modern. So I bought her something else. Okay, and that's and this is just this means a lot because this was a family tradition, not only um, to do this as a gift, and it makes me remind reminds me of my mother and and my aunt Billy. So, okay, we can move around. Whoever wants to go next. Well, let me just tell you that all of my things that are special are at my daughter's house because we go to her house for seder, so she has everything there. Um, I don't keep anything here. <laughs> okay. So I'll go next. So this, this wine decanter, and there are six of these glasses. They belong to my father's mother. Um, I use other glasses for, uh, that belong to my mother's mother. They're packed away still because I haven't, you know, I'm not ready to unpack my Pesadic of things yet. So, but these I keep out all the time. So they're not you know, terribly expensive things, but they have an awful lot of sentimental value because I have, th I use things from both of my grandmothers at my Seder every year. So these are my, my things that I keep. That's beautiful, that's beautiful, Jerry. Mm -hmm. I made this at a um, sisterhood um, in, in my, my sisterhood down in Florida. And I have everything in New York because I do Passover in New York. So last year when I was stuck here, and it's just a wine glass, um, I had nothing. So I literally didn't even have matzah because I don't eat it. I don't eat chumitz, but I can't eat matzah. So I had nothing in the house last Passover. And I set the table with this big stuffed bear with my Florida Regents <laughs> uh, t-shirt on from the cruise <laughs> and my little Alexa and Tony Fauci. And I, the only thing I had to have, you know, at my Seder was besides an inanimate bear that doesn't talk, Alexa who does talk, and Tony who I love, um, was my one thing that I have a Passover in the Florida house. So I'm not gonna bring it to New York in case there's another pandemic one day, but this is what I made, so. Nice. Susie, you're muted. You're muted, Susie, you're muted. She has to leave, she said. Oh, she has to leave, okay. Bye-bye, thank you Thanks for Thanks so coming. much for coming. See you tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Anybody else have anything to share? I'll go. Oh, Barb, you want to go? Barb, you sure. go. I just jump right into your program. But that's all right. To write. We're happy you're here. Yeah, that's fine. The more the merrier. Yeah. So um, I have my my father's parents did not. They celebrated uh, Passover and that they didn't eat hummus, but I don't think they had anything ritual. We we only had dinner. We didn't have a seder. My mother's family, my mother's parents had 
things. So everything I have really is from my grandmother. Um, so this was her matzo plate, which she used as a Seder plate. But I looked at it as I got older, I said, it's not a Seder plate. It actually tells the story. It has the four questions. It's really cool. She had this on the center of her table every year when we were there. And then it followed to my mother's house and it followed to my house. And then the other, I'll pretty much everything I have for Passover belonged to either my mother or her mother. So this was my, this is the Coast Eliyahu, the Lenox. This was my mom's. And I also have the big Seder plate as well, which was my mom's. So, and I, it's funny that I think about, it's like, what do I have that's, that was just mine? And the truth is, well, it's all mine now, but I don't, it's, you know, it's, it's all their stuff. And I, it, I really enjoy using that because it just feels like it, they're all still with us and they're all still having a great time and cooking yep. and my grandmother getting up in the middle of the Seder to check the roast. So, and he asked me a million questions and my mother, my grandfather ran his Seder in Hebrew and Yiddish combined fast. And my brothers and I would sit there and we would wait. And my mother would say, pop, stop. Okay, Bruce, do your question, do your thing. Scott, you get to do that. And everybody had something to say, but she had to like, she's the only one who could follow him and stop him. So those are things that I remember. And that's why having all those things with us is really just a great thing. And Barbara, I want to know, I have your other grandparents stuff that they oh, might good. not have, that they don't have Seder. I don't have, I have her Passover pots and I mean, right. they were fairly used. So I still have those things. That's right. what I got <laughs> when we got back. At least they're in the family. So I've <laughs> so forgotten to get something, but I, I pulled this. I keep this on the wall and I take it down for Pesach. And it, it's literally, let me see, I was just married 53 years. So it was given to me as a wedding present. And I oh. didn't use it for the first one or two years because my parents, well, actually one year, my parents would do the Seder, but then my mother had had a stroke. And so I started doing the Seder and my father gave me also, I have it, it's a Kiddush cup to have. Um, so I do that. And then I also added a Miriam's cup and, and things. So, but this just always is, it's, it's very old fashioned, very. And actually when I have okay. a Seder, it's long and I generally have a Seder plate at one end and a Seder plate at the other end. The other one is more modern. But, um, you know, but I always use this one still. So I have the same one, and Really good. <laughs> it's a wedding present also. I have a similar one. <laughs> my daughter has my mother-in-law's hanging in her dining room. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have a Lennox. They have, if they don't have Lennox, they have the patina blue, green ones. I guess. One yeah. or the other. The Lennox one was really popular in the 70s, and everybody got them, and then the old patina ones. Well, I got married in 81, but I still got but Lennox is always a hot, hot item for a wedding gift. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Anybody else? Just to, real fast. I, I don't have anything to, to show, but I, I my uh, my daughter does not, uh, She one thing she takes after me, she does, she's not such a great cook, but <laughs> it's recorded. And I, I oh, all right. Well, she, she's not listening. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> she, my granddaughter, her daughter loves to come over and bake a uh, pesa de mandel bread with me, um, which which I make a lot of that because a lot of people do enjoy it. And so um, I do not do the Seder at my house. We've always gone to my brother's house. And, um, but my granddaughter last year, she wasn't able to be with me. So she took the recipe and she made it and my daughter wrote and said it was really good. It was, it was, it was very, very good. So I was very proud of my granddaughter. And it's something now that that she lo she loves to bake, and so she will carry on that tradition, which makes me very happy. So I can also share real quick with you that I have a bag already in my kitchen. I'm going up to Delaware tomorrow to pick up my granddaughter for a few days, and we have to take her all of the. Passover stuff because in Delaware they don't have good grocery stores where she is 
So, or it's so expensive that it's not worth it. So, so it's really quite funny. Um, but yeah, it, what we do and how we do it and the stories we tell and all of the things we heard today and Rabbi was wonderful. Um, okay. I could listen to her forever. <laughs> um, so just thank you for uh, putting this together and, and uh, having some of our individual members here so that we could uh, share some things with them and get to meet them and know them a little bit. I think, I think our hope is that, um, and uh, give me one sec. I was just gonna say, I think that we would like to do maybe one or two more over the year just to touch bases with everyone. And we, we are gonna be making phone calls, right Jill, to our our and individual we have, members. We also have a, a, law, a lost group that about yeah. 20 members that we either don't have email addresses for and, and or they have opted out. So we have to start with getting getting a hold of those. Mimi, you'll be getting a phone call soon. <laughs> We're going to be dividing up the list and, and making personal calls just to touch bases with everybody. And um, so that, that will be going on too. But I, I don't know. We haven't got a plan yet for the next meet and greet. But hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be able to do it around another holiday. What do you think, Jill? <laughs> well, well yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 When I was president of the region, I did get it was a short list, and I did make phone calls, and yeah. I didn't do it enough, but I did do it, and that was appreciated. So I well, would suggest that each of your presidents of your regions, they should make phone calls, and at least every so many months, because otherwise, and I have felt this, and I love my region, and I love Kathy, and I loved you, but I have I was feeling very alone very, not, not with, not till I got onto Makom B'Yechad and saw everybody. And, but for the couple of years that I was an individual, I felt like, you know, you're uh, not a member and, of a sisterhood and, and it's really hard. And let me, bye Barb. I'm going to call you. I got to call you. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do also, and then Florida region actually started there is a chairperson for individual, a board position yeah. as individual chair. Um, and I, you already, I gave you some, um, so we do have somebody who's, who is an individual. She just started this past year. So we, you know, it was not that great. It was something that Kathy decided that we did need and it was a good, a good decision. I got an email from her, but that's yeah. it. Oh, did you? Okay. Um, but we'll be giving we'll be to people. those people in the region some more, more um, follow through and more instruction about what they what we expect of them. So and this is a great year. This is a great year for the regions with their conferences to engage those individual members because they don't have to walk out of their house. They don't have to know one. They don't have to worry about who they're sitting with at lunch. And the programming is usually, I'm sure, in every region going to be fabulous. So I wouldn't worry about just spring to get together if every region president was ambitious in in the outreach to. Um, not the president herself, but someone to do that, to call those individual members and say, this is the year to feel connected to the region if, you, but, if you're a little bit off to the side. But also, the membership think VPs in the region should help with that. And we certainly yeah. could get that done. So if there are any in Seaboard, just let me know that okay. you don't have an email. We'll you, follow uh, up. I, okay, I'll let what you know because I have, the, I have the list. And you should actually be able... If you go into your sisterhood list for your region, the first thing on the yes. list is your individual members. It's listed as like a separate synagogue, as this is a separate right. sisterhood. So you Machine. can see who, who all your individual. I have a master list, and it's just in alphabetic order. I mean, I know what regions are, and it's no. And if, if you have problems, let me know, and I can send you a list of. I can just cut and paste this Excel spreadsheet and give it yep. to you. I have it. I, I okay. We, okay. We we work with it. But okay. Jerry, you were going to say? But I was just going to say that, uh, Margie, I agree with what you said because um, um, Esther, who's the, Esther Lichtenstein, who's the region president in North Atlantic, reached out to me to ask me to do something for the conference. Now, it happens that Esther and I are related through marriage, so I I'm connected, but it made me feel more involved when she asked me to do, I'm just handling the milestones. Nothing, not a big job, but something that I'm used to doing from in the past. So it made me feel really connected as an individual member by asking me not just to attend, but to actually, you know, part do something. 
you know. That's the answer. I don't right? think and that does that does help. You're right. Yeah. And we do have and we do actually have two individual members on the Florida board. I'm just I'm finishing up the general board. And Anne has been on our general board. She remained on the board and to stay active. I think she is active. And um, that's like, so, yeah, I need to. Yeah. <laughs> I just need it. <laughs> and yeah. And then certain certain people just want to. And, and, and you know, we're not going to turn down people that want to work. I mean, definitely not. That, right? But you definitely have to call people. I, I really well, I, I believe it. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And that's something what we're planning on doing. We're going to do it as a as women's league and then we'll probably be able to then turn it over as as the international women's league and then we'll hopefully be able to turn it over to each region to continue so yeah and i don't think that, that all the region um presidents think about um the individual members when it comes to asking people to serve on their board yeah or something like that so you know, they need to know it and need to know that we need to get the in, the individual members involved too. Exactly. And we do, because we have individual members on our board. So yeah, we do, yeah. There are many of the regions do. Yeah. You know, a lot of the gals are on the radar because they're past congregants, they're past region presidents, Jerry, Eve. I mean, we're talking about branch presidents, right? Kelly Abbey. These are names of people that everybody knows, but hunt, you know, over a you know, over a hundred people have joined since the pandemic to go on the Psalms every day, whatever they're calling it. Um, and so now it's a new crop of people who really were not on our radar, like right. Susie. There is over oh, 220, example. right now there's over 220 individual members. No, I know, but we had a wow. hundred before. So I know that. So we always had about a hundred going. So I'm saying we have about over a hundred people that have joined pretty yeah. much since the pandemic to take advantage of the Zoom world. And so those gals are not necessarily the names we know, but they have found us or we have found them. So that you've got to, you've got to cultivate those relationships. Well, that, and that's exactly what I did. And now, um, uh, Lori Beth S uh, Sussman. Yeah, we knew Lori Beth. I well, mean, she's gone back a long time. But I didn't. Oh, I know her for years, years and years and years. Oh, I don't know where, you know. Southern nobody, gal. She was a Nobody I knew in Southern knew you know, said they knew her. I did. But you're not in Southern. You know everybody more. <laughs> I am in Southern. You don't want to tell me I'm not in Southern. Excuse me. Am no, I not? No, no, you don't. don't get an honor you all this. I mean, Jill, you don't need to be recording all this. Let me just stop the recording. Yeah. But I will say this, I think it's so nice that we are doing these Zooms that, you know, and, and I'm sorry that other people don't take advantage of it. See, this is what I, I have to keep on. And, and I think it's so important. I get to see, I've met people and it just helps. It just helps and it, it's a good feeling and it's what Women's League is all about. So. I agree, Ann. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this program. Thank you. Thank everybody it was very nice. Great program. Thank you. Yeah, actually, my niece, she, she's such an amazing teacher. And it's funny, when I, Rabbi Ellen told us that she wasn't able to be here today, I said, is it okay if I ask my niece? And she said, oh, Abby's a great teacher. That's the first thing that came out of Rabbi Ellen's. So, yeah, and she is. And, and her teaching is one of her passions. I mean, she was at Davidson before she went to, J before she, she was at, at, J at Davidson first and then decided to go to rabbinical school. So, yeah, so. Uh, thank you, everybody. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.